Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Harder. I'm executive editor of Cypher News, where we cover the opportunities and challenges of the energy transition. Thanks so much for being here with us today. We are at the very, very beginning of a global energy transition, and it is prompting a lot of questions. The name of this session is, is the energy transition moving too fast? There's a lot of people who think we're actually moving too slowly. Based on today's climate science, how fast should we move? And what are some of the unintended consequences that we should consider? Based on today's and tomorrow's technologies, how fast should we move with this transition? We have two scientists with us today to help shed light on many of these questions and more. Here with me today to my immediate left is Chris Field, director of Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford University. Chris is a climate scientist whose research focuses on climate change solutions and adapting to a warmer world, including decreasing risks from coastal flooding and wildfires. He co-chaired one of the working groups at the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, from 2008 to 2015 the world's foremost scientific body on this topic. To his left, we have Steve Koonin, a professor at New York University's Business and Engineering Schools. In prior lives, Steve was a Caltech professor for 30 years, BP's chief scientist for five years, and served as undersecretary for science at the US Energy Department from 2009 to 2011. You may be familiar with his 2021 book, Unsettled, which seeks to raise questions about what climate science tells us and how it gets interpreted by policymakers, the public, and the media. After a discussion among us here on stage, we're going to throw it out to you in the audience, so please be thinking of things you would like to ask the panelists. An opening question for you both. In many ways, climate change is the ultimate risk. It involves processing immense amount of sometimes uncertain information in science, technology, economics, and more. And often that model decades, sometimes even centuries into the future, not just for one part of our planet, but the entire planet. Some say because of all of that, we are risking moving the energy transition from oil, natural gas, and coal to cleaner energy far too fast. But there's also people who say that we are risking moving too slowly precisely because of a lot of the uncertainty that exists. So I would like each of you, and Steve, why don't we start with you? How do each of you view the energy transition through the lens of risk? A couple of weeks ago, I was browsing the White House website and came across a white paper that was issued in the middle of March jointly by OMB and the Council of Economic Advisors. The subject of the white paper was the impact of future warming on the US economy and budget. That sounds like a pretty nerdy topic, but in fact, the paper was quite remarkable because it directly contradicted, in a very credible way, the prevailing notion that we've got a climate emergency and we're facing catastrophe. Unfortunately, those notions are common in the popular discussion among politicians and sadly in the minds of many young people. What the researchers did in that report was to compile and analyze the results of 13 independent peer-reviewed studies on how much the US GDP would be affected as the globe warmed. And what they found was for a warming of about 2.7 degrees in the future centigrade, which is about the middle of what the IPCC predicts by the end of this century, the GDP would be impacted by less than 2%. That's not 2% in growth, but that's 2% absolute. And so what it means is that instead of growing by a factor of three as the GDP would ordinarily do under historical trends, it would grow by a factor of 2.9 instead of three. Hardly a catastrophe. Now there's a lot that is perhaps surprising in that, but to people who've been following this, as I have, you find similar statements in other US climate assessments put out by the government, 
and in the IPCC reports for the globe as a whole. Now, there's a lot to question about those estimates. A lot of uncertainty. The economy is not the only measure of well-being. There will be disparate impacts uh, across sectors and regions. And the models are frankly not great. I like to joke that when you combine economics with climate modeling, you get doubly dismal science. Well, if you're willing to deny those consensus results, we can look to the past to understand how societies have fared as the globe warmed. In fact, the globe has warmed 1.3 degrees since 1900. And during that time, we have seen the greatest flourishing ever of humanity. The population went up by a factor of five. The global lifespan went from 32 years to 72 years. GDP per capita went up by a factor of seven. And interestingly, the death rate from extreme weather events went down by a factor of 50. If you look over the last 30 years, the impacts of weather on GDP are at the few tenths of a percent level and have actually declined. And fewer people are dying over the last 20 years from temperature extremes, quite contrary to what you would take away from the media. Well, people say, I'm not going to believe all of that. There is still some chance of something really bad happening because we're going into territory with respect to carbon dioxide concentrations that we've never been historically. And you know, I might agree with that, other things being equal. Unfortunately, other things are not equal. We've got to balance the uncertain risks and benefits of a changing climate against the world's growing demand for energy and the costs and efficacies of various solutions. Steve, that's really great. I would love to give Chris a chance as well. Uh, just go one more minute I've got, and then I'm, I'm done. If you put your finger on the scale by exaggerating the certainty, the magnitude, and the urgency of the climate threat, then you are inducing actions that are probably worse than the climate change itself. I appreciate you saying that, and we will definitely dive into some of what you just said. But Chris, would love to hear you Steve, reflect upon the risks. Steve's characterization of the remarkable progress that society's made in the last century uh, really underscores the opportunity we have to tackle climate change. And, and we need to tackle it for a very simple reason. The, the damages from a changing climate are real and growing. What we understand now is that if you look across the world, places that are already cold benefit from warming. Places that are already hot suffer enormously. Uh, the U.S. is, is uh, uniquely positioned in that some parts of the U.S., the parts that are cold, Aspen, uh, actually benefit from warming, at least in economic terms. And the places that are hot, especially the southeast, really suffer. And if you look around the world, uh, the pattern is incredibly stark with the most severe consequences of the warming we've seen today and the warming we'll see in the future if we don't accelerate progress on tackling the climate crisis really suffer immensely. Uh, one way to think about it is that the most recent numbers put the social cost of carbon, the, the total amount of economic damages that are caused by releasing a ton of CO2 or CO2 equivalents in the atmosphere, a little less than $200. $200 of damages from each ton of CO2 that's released to the atmosphere. And we know that many of the solutions that allow us to transition from the current polluting energy to clean energy sources are available even at a net benefit to the economy, but a, a large number at uh, $20 per ton of CO2 equivalent or less, and we could really bring emissions down to zero with a net investment of something like $100 per ton of CO2 equivalent. So what it looks like at this point is that the benefits of tackling climate change with an ambitious acceleration of the technologies that we currently have and are currently deploying would be at least twice as cost effective as the damages of not taking action in the near term.
Steve, I want to go back to you. Thank you for that, Chris. Uh, I want to quote your former boss um, who hired you at the Energy Department, mm. then Energy Secretary Stephen Chu. Mm -hmm. In an article from May uh, 2021 about your book, Chu said that he hired you precisely because you offer a skeptic view of some of the science, which he says, quote, is a lot of what keeps science honest, end quote. But he went on to say that he thinks you're, quote, missing the point. And this is where he and I differ. And he continues, it has to do with risk management. If there's a reasonable chance that some very bad things are going to happen, shouldn't you take steps, end quote. Do you think your former boss is wrong? Um, no, but you know, your perception of risk depends upon where you sit. If we were having, well, first of all, you cannot take risk to zero. Right? I'm about to get on an airplane, and there is some small risk that something's going to happen, but I do it because there are other benefits. All right? With respect to energy, there are 80% of the globe, 6.5 billion people who do not have adequate energy. And if some of them were in this conversation, as we had, uh, as you know, the former uh, petroleum minister from Kenya, uh, they would have a very different risk calculus. And it is immoral to impose our own risk calculus on them. Well, I appreciate you big... mentioning that. We have Andrew in the audience, so we may call on him uh, in a little bit. But before we get to him, we'd love to oh, give Chris a chance. I just wanted to make it clear that under the Paris Agreement, the idea is that each country brings its solutions to the table. Uh, the Paris Agreement doesn't require poor countries to move more quickly than they have the potential to, but it really has, is based in this concept of common but differentiated responsibility. Each country should figure out uh, what it can do in order to deliver solutions. And the U.S., we're uniquely positioned to be a real leader, a leader in the technology, a leader in the finance, a leader in addressing the fundamental ethical and moral challenges that let us deliver a just energy transition. That doesn't mean that that every country is going to move at the same pace. It doesn't even mean that um, there'll be no more construction of fossil-based energy delivery systems, especially in the poor world. What it does mean is that those with the opportunity to lead are being challenged to step up and take on the leadership that I think will define each country's status in the decades to come. That's great, and I look forward to digging into that in a little bit more. And so we've given Andrew notice that we may ask him to, to provide a question for the panel um, in a few minutes. Um, just a couple more uh, moments on this topic of what the science compels us to do, and then I want to move to the, the technological changes that we're seeing in our energy system. Steve, a question for you, and then a, a separate question for Chris. So it's a fact that most scientists think that climate change publicly say that they think climate change is an urgent problem that compels a rapid reduction in greenhouse gases. You don't share that position from what I understand. And so my question for you, Steve, is why do you think that you're right and most of the other experts in climate science are wrong? So my own thoughts are informed by what are the economic damage estimates in the U.S. climate assessments in the IPCC. And I think my question back to the scientists were, are those wrong? Uh, do you deny that they are what they are? I'd even ask the CEA and OMB, you know, how come you write that but still talk about a climate crisis? And, and what do they say to you? Uh, they have no answer, okay? There are uncertainties and it could be worse and so on. One thing that um, Steve has talked about a lot, um, and I have as well as a member of the media, as humans are experiencing more extreme weather, uh, me the media and policymakers and others, and Chris, this is a question for you, uh, we often are connecting ex singular extreme weather events to climate change. And I think sometimes we all connect those dots maybe a little bit too quickly. And that's an area of room for improvement, shall we say. Would love to hear from you, Chris, about what words of caution could you give members of the media and policymakers and the general public, such as millions of people in the southern part of this country right now that are sweltering under a heat wave, what word of caution would you give them about connecting single weather events to climate change? And secondarily to that, 
some of us may have read about the rise in attribution studies, which are scientific studies seeking to make that connection between single events, weather events, and a warming planet. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that connection and the attribution studies. I think it's important for people to realize that the global infrastructure for climate change science is, is incredibly robust. Like all science, we're learning new things all the time and we're discovering that some things we thought we knew weren't exactly right. But the core elements of our understanding of how additional greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increase global temperatures have been in place for more than 100 years and really haven't been challenged in any substantive way. Steve agrees with me on that. And that what the advances in the science are really pointing to uh, the, the influence of potential feedbacks that may operate with a greater or a lesser intensity. And we're especially fortunate in, in climate change that for 35 years now, we've had the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, a, a consortium of all of the world's countries who have tasked the scientific community to figure out what we know and what we don't know about a changing climate and what the assessments can really tell us is what stood the test of time. As we get more and more information, what do, what do we see as um, is really sticking and what's not? And the IPCC has been incredibly accurate in its projections about where we're headed in terms of temperature, of precipitation, of extreme events, of sea ice, of glaciers. Uh, across the board, the, the IPCC has been incredibly consistent and incredibly successful in uh, assimilating the scientific information and, and painting a realistic picture of where we're headed. In the context of extreme events, I was uh, privileged to lead the IPCC special report on managing the risks of extremes and disasters was the first major report on the link between climate change and extreme events was published in 2012. And in that report, we already saw links between a changing climate and, and some trends in extremes, especially trends in heat waves. And since that time, we've seen remarkable progress in our ability to do what's called single event attribution. It's kind of a nerdy concept, but increasingly, we can, after the fact, look at an extreme event and we can say, how much did the warming that's already occurred change the odds of this kind of event? A good example is that the really punishing heat dome that affected the Pacific Northwest last year was essentially impossible in the pre-warmed climate. Many other events, we, we don't see a clear fingerprint of human activity on the probability of the event occurring. When you look at heat waves, about 95% show a fingerprint of the warming that's already occurred. Heavy precipitation events, it's around 50%. Uh, droughts have been very difficult, and, and the single event attribution on droughts is far from conclusive one way or the other. Steve, give you a very quick chance to respond, and then would love to move to the technology okay, side. About of attribution. Chris, you're a scientist, as I am, and as you know, the touchstone of science is validation against observations. And these attribution studies, I would submit, are not science, because there's no way you can test them. It's like your fortune teller telling you that her intervention helped you win the lottery after the fact. Okay, so we need 30, 40 years of attribution studies to know whether we're getting it right or not, and we don't have that. May I respond to that? Very quickly. Uh, let me just say that the attribution scholarship is as solidly based in our understanding of climate change as it can possibly be. It's a, it's a very, very solid foundation. And if you in the audience want to hear more about this, please raise your hand uh, when we go to questions in a little bit. But I want to shift to the technology side of this equation. We have seen big investments into clean energy over the last few years, whether it's private venture capital money going into new cl climate technologies or big government investments here in the United States, of course, led by the Inflation Reduction Act and similar actions in Europe. To what degree are these efforts helping to ease the technological side of the energy transition? And what are some unintended consequences that we should be looking out for as we see this influx of money, both private and public? Steve, do you want to start? Sure. Um, you know, the, the way in which we will reduce emissions globally is through technology development. 
and demonstration. And I'm all for that. And I think the Inflation Reduction Act uh, is a good step in that direction. Where I have trouble is in the deployment issues that, or deployment actions that have taken. And let me just give you one example. The Inflation Reduction Act has significant tax credits for the investment in wind and solar and the production of electricity from wind and solar. And the thing about the grid is you can't have a grid run on wind and solar alone because of reliability issues. You need a whole backup grid that's at least as capable as the wind and solar and should be zero emissions. And if you're going to do that, you might ask, why are we doing wind and solar at all since we have to have this backup grid? To say it in a pithy way, wind and solar can be an ornament to the real grid, but they can never be the real grid. And so I think we're wasting money in those incentives. The Inflation Reduction Act is really the first piece of major climate change legislation that's incredibly important. And we were, we were seeing yesterday in the session on hydrogen that, that the credit for green hydrogen is already uh, bringing industries into the U.S. from, from offshore industries that are, that are convinced that they can develop hydrogen competitively in the context of the, of the extra resources that are available through the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, there's always a challenge in managing a big influx of money, but there's no question that what we need in order to really solidify the U.S. leadership in technology including the leadership in the technology of finance, including finance for developing countries, is, um, is going to be enhanced with the resources that we have. It's hard to be confident about which technologies are going to win and which ones are going to drop by the wayside, but we already are seeing the outline of a U.S. and a global energy system that's based in, in renewable energy, in extensive electrification, and in only using fossil resources where we don't have uh, ready alternatives, for example, in aviation fuel. Steve, I know you want to say something. I want to add on a question for you, and then you can um, answer my question and um, respond with your comment. There is a lot of investment specifically regarding variable wind and solar electricity. There's a lot of investment going into long-duration energy storage beyond lithium-ion batteries, whether it's new pumped hydro storage or uh, lots of other really wonky ideas that we can get into um, if this audience wants to. But Needless to say, there's a lot of innovation happening there. And I want to harken back to something that Walter Isaacson said yesterday in one of the, the evening sessions or late afternoon sessions where he mentioned that saying that most of us have probably heard, technology moves slowly until it happens really fast. So my question for you, Steve, is what I heard from you is that that won't happen, and so therefore we can't use wind and solar. Are you, would you call yourself a pessimist when it comes to technological innovation? No, but you know, I've had the experience of being in industry, in the energy business, and understanding just how hard it is. Let me give you some bulk numbers. Uh, Chris is optimistic about a fossil-free future. We have spent over the last decade about $4 trillion globally and the fraction of the world's energy that comes from fossil fuels remains at 80%. Okay? And yes, there's more wind and solar, but there's even more fossil fuel. I think people don't appreciate how recalcitrant the energy system is and the scale of investment that it's going to take to make it fossil free. Credible estimates say that it's going to take about 5 to 7% of U.S. GDP for the next 30 years if you want to go uh, zero emissions by 2050. Now, that's an investment or an effort on the scale of World War II. The country only did World War II for five years. This is World War II for 30 years. And the question is, are we really up for it? Are there other ways we could spend one and a half trillion dollars a year? Okay. Chris, do you have a response yeah. to that? And it's important to recognize that investments on this scale of trillions of dollars a year uh, can pay off handsomely. They can pay off handsomely in terms of job creation. Most of the estimates are that building out green energy infrastructure creates six times as many jobs as those that are lost. Being the leader in, in this field also establishes the, 
the profile of the U.S. for the decades to come. And, and I think that leadership of the nation on the global stage is, is an incredibly important part of this. So when we look at the, at the cost of the investment, which are, which are real, we need to put them in the context of the advantages that come from being able to mobilize these technologies and the advantages that come from the decreased damages. And as we've already discussed globally, it looks like the decrease in climate damages is at least twice as big as the investment that's required. Um, you know, both of them, by the way, are relatively small. The damages are a few percent of GDP. So we're arguing yeah, about something. We that agree that the, that the global economy is likely to grow, uh, whether we invest in solving the climate crisis or whether we don't. So, so you agree perhaps there isn't a crisis? I don't agree there's not a crisis. Okay, tell me. The reason that, that I believe we need to accelerate action is we have this, this diverse landscape of vulnerability where the large majority of the world's population in poor countries already are already suffering and poised to suffer dramatically as a consequence of rising temperatures. The rich folks in the cold countries, you should move to Norway if you, if you think we're not going to act on climate change, do fine. I want to move to our discussion about um, the importance of the developing countries and how we can balance uh, an energy transition with, with energy needs um, from developing countries. Uh, just a, some, a couple quick facts to level set this part of the conversation. 48 countries of sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa, are home to 13% of the global population, but have contributed just 0.55% of cumulative global emissions compared to America's cumulative 25%. That's according to our world and data statistics. I just want to level set that because this part of the world, we're mostly responsible for the problem. So my question for both of you is, how can we ensure that developing countries, and by that I mean the entire, most of the entire continent of Africa, along with some southeastern Asian countries, how can we ensure that these countries have adequate energy access to prosper, just like the United States, and where do you see the role of fossil fuels fitting in there? We'd love to hear from each of you and then maybe Andrew give you a chance to maybe ask them a question and, and provide a comment. The answer is you cannot square that dilemma. The developing countries, and as I said, there are about six and a half billion people in that category, are energy starved. Uh, there are three billion people who use less electricity every year than the average US refrigerator. The average person in the U.S. uses 30 times the energy every year that a person in Nigeria does, okay? The overwhelming priority for those folks is increased, reliable, affordable energy. And right now, fossil fuels are the way for them to get that. They're saying that themselves, and we should not stop them from doing that. I think it's important to delineate between the different types of fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, and coal. Uh, it's my understanding natural gas is where most of the focus is in terms of developing natural gas resources. There's a big climate difference between coal and natural gas. Just wanted to provide that interlude, Chris. So the, the richest 10% of the world's population are responsible for between 35 and 45% of, of heat trapping pollution. The, the poorest 50% are responsible for 10 to 13 percent of global emissions. It's a, it's a tiny fraction, and I agree with Steve that energy poverty is a critically important problem that needs to be addressed, and in some places it should be addressed with additional commitments to fossil fuels. In many parts of the world, there is no conceivable way tomorrow to turn a switch and to activate the green energy opportunities that we have in the United States today. When we think long term, there are basically two kinds of strategies that we can mobilize in order to improve energy access for the green technologies to the developing world. Uh, one is making the technologies so cheap that they're the obvious choice. We've made good progress with wind and solar to date, but the issue of long-term storage that both Steve and Amy have raised uh, still presents some pressing challenges that need to be addressed. Uh, the other is um, 
international finance, creative financing that allows countries to build out in ways that take advantage of, of their future growth in, in ways that you know, go beyond their current capabilities. And right at this moment, the big emphasis is on the first of those strategies, making the technologies so cheap that they're the obvious choice. But one of the things that we need to be thinking about in the future is deploying finance in order to ensure outcomes that are underscoring the importance of, of climate justice and energy access. I want to um, turn the mic over to Andrew in just a moment um, so he can introduce himself and provide a comment and a question. But before we do, I want to uh, provide one more stat that I think helps try to resolve some of the cognitive dissonance that we face in this issue, right? Because there's a lot of competing priorities here. Uh, so I want to share a st statistic that surprised me, and it's from the nonprofit Energy for Growth Hub, which advocates for uh, developing countries and energy access. Uh, and their math found, happy to share it afterwards if folks are interested, that if all of uh, Africa's electricity consumption tripled overnight using only natural gas, the additional CO2 would equal 0.6% of all global emissions. And so that basic fact actually thinks, actually argues that perhaps it is possible for a lot of countries to increase their natural gas, despite what some environmentalists say, and also continue a transition. Would love to hear briefly from each of you, and then we'll go to Andrew. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, you won't argue, I can't argue with the numbers, but what I would ask is if you tripled Africa's electricity, how far does that get them to a, let's say, even just mid-level country? My guess is not very far. It's a good question. I will follow up with that. And, and I think the, the numbers that you cite really underscore the way that we can be thoughtful and strategic about the deployment of fossil resources where they really make a difference. And increasingly we can think about coupling, especially when we use natural gas for electricity production, of capturing the CO2 and investing in technology that's, that's designed for turnover and the life expectancy of a natural gas power plant is typically around 15 years where a coal power plant is more like 50. We really shouldn't be building new coal. Uh, I want to now um, invite Andrew to just introduce yourself uh, and your relevant background and then ask a question and provide any comments. And then after that, we are going to throw it out to the whole audience. So please be thinking of things you'd like to ask. Amy, thank you very much. My name is Andrew Kamal. I'm at the uh, Center for Global Energy Policy at Columbia. And um, previously to that, I was the Principal Secretary for Petroleum and Mining in Kenya. You know, all these facts are there. You know, if we burnt all the natural gas to provide electricity if we if we it wouldn't make much of a difference to the world but it would make a huge difference to the people who are living that life unfortunately and this is probably the question i'd like to ask uh, steve what can the scientific community do at these cops and all these uh, un organization meetings to convince the financial community that there's not a one-size-fits-all because they've entered these these um, these agreements that they're not going to finance fossil fuels now just to give you a bit of background on the hypocrisy of that all is that yes for the last five years that has been the case until the ukraine russia conflict then all of a sudden money was made available to develop gas export facilities in africa where previously there was no money. Yeah, there was no money for that, and all of a sudden there's money. And you mentioned about coal. So South Africa entered into this agreement with JetP, the Just uh, Energy Transition Partnership, that they were going to get $9 billion, $8.5 billion, to start their conversion from coal. Okay, they've never seen the money because it ended up being a loan. It wasn't a grant as it was agreed. And the, vice pre the deputy president of South Africa was asking, so we are supposed to stop using coal, which is in our ground, but our export terminal at Richards Bay is full. So this coal is going somewhere. They're not being asked to decarbonize, but we are being asked to decarbonize. The question is, how does the scientific community convince governments and convince financial institutions that this is an energy transition and people are going to be on different paths of this energy transition. 
Thank you for that question, Andrew. Would love to hear from each of you. You know what? I think we we agree that different paths and financing different paths critically important. I, I will say there's a big difference between um, current existing coal and planning for its gradual transition out of the energy system and building new coal. And I think that the argument for building new coal is a really, really weak one. The argument for being smart about using our existing energy assets to help the uh, provide additional energy around the developing world really a central one. And I hope that part of the extra investments that are available through the Inflation Reduction Act will in fact allow us to be a lot smarter about the way that we invest in in fossil where it's the appropriate choice and the way we invest in uh, non-emitting technologies where they're the appropriate choice. So, so uh, you know, given our difference in personalities, I might say it a bit more sharply. Uh, you know, we need to cancel, we scientists need to cancel the crisis. When again, when you look at the reports, as I have quoted, there's very little support for the notion that we're facing a climate catastrophe. The models, even the modelers say they're not fit for regional projections. I'm happy to give you quotes. So let's get the finance people to understand this is a long-term problem, but we don't have to solve it in 30 or 40 years. We've got a century to deal with it. Let's get a plan that integrates technology, development, existing technologies, economics, and so on, and gets us to where we want to get to. It is the urgency, the false urgency, that is so destructive, I think. Let me comment briefly on this question of the climate crisis and whether or not it's a crisis. Steve and I agree that climate change, the climate change we would experience, even with continued high emissions through the 21st century, isn't likely to be civilization ending in the sense that there's no future for humans. Uh, but it is a crisis if you live on an island that's no longer habitable, if you live in a coastal region where um, y your community has to relocate. If you live in parts of California where the wildfires are now so severe that, that the air quality is no longer acceptable levels. And so in the same sense that we need to understand their diverse paths to the energy transition, we need to understand that, that you don't have to have a civilization ending crisis to have it be a crisis for millions of people around the world. And that's very much where we are with climate. Would like to go to the audience uh, to have some questions. This um, gentleman here in the blue and front, and there's a mic running around. So please let me know if you have a specific panelist you'd like to address your question to. Thank you, Jim Dubin. I have a question. We've heard about fossil fuel. We've heard about wind. We've heard about solar. What about nuclear? Okay. Okay. I mean, you want to talk about development? That's been developed. Look at France and what's the percentage of non-automobile energy that's provided by nuclear, okay, as opposed to fossil fuel. Why isn't that been talked about, much less as an alternative? A absolutely, all right, full disclosure first. You know, I started life as a nuclear physicist. I can tell you in great detail how fission works. I'm not sure I trust myself to design a reactor. But, you know, <laughs> all right, okay. But, you know, when I was in the Department of Energy, we helped get the small modular reactor research program going. I personally think if the world is going to go to net zero, at some point, it's got to be fission in a big way. All right? We can talk about fusion separately, but fission is there, as you say. It's reliable. It's proven. It's too expensive right now, but we can get there. I agree with Steve. I think the other important element to consider, though, is, is the politics. And, and right now, the politics are strongly against deployment of, of additional nuclear resources in many parts of the world. And it's important to recognize that we're really talking about massive investments that need to be made in the next few decades. Well, and we talked about massive investments in wind and solar and, you know, it, if you can make if you can make the nuclear acceptable 
it has a real place. I agree with you. For most of the world, nuclear is acceptable. China well, is deploying reactors at a blistering pace. It's also, in, in my view, maybe I'm wrong, I'm not the expert, it's more practicable than having wind farms and solar to generate the amount of energy we need to go zero carbon. But I know point. both of these um, scientists are happy to keep chatting about nuclear power after um, the discussion. <laughs> Would love, and it sounds like Aspen, you guys need a, a whole panel on uh, nuclear power next time. Yeah. Um, uh, next question, this gentleman right here. Uh, do you have any way of assessing the health impacts of climate change? Is that part of any of these models? A absolutely, and I, I talked earlier about the, uh, the calculation of the social cost of carbon, which the uh, Climate Impacts Lab, a really spectacular effort at the University of Chicago led by Michael Greenstone has recently concluded, and it's the health costs of climate change that really dominate that social cost of carbon, especially the mortality costs of uh, high temperatures. But one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that whenever we look at an energy transition, one of the huge benefits of transitioning away from especially a, a coal-fired electricity sector is all the lives that are saved by the improved air quality and the co-benefits of transitioning away from coal toward non-polluting energy really augments the health benefits that come from not overheating the climate. So, so I know Michael Greenstone quite well and uh, know the work that Chris is referring to on the mortality effects of uh, increased temperatures. If you take the most extreme IPCC scenarios, which IPCC has now said are improbable, so-called 8.5, you get a, a level of global deaths incremental that's about the same as infectious diseases about 80 per 100,000, which is a lot, okay? There's some uncertainty and it goes negative. If you take a more plausible scenario, let's say 4.5, then the uncertainty, the, the net is essentially no impact at all and the uncertainty is both positive and negative. So Michael has done those studies, I think they're good, but they are misrepresented by looking at the extremes rather than what the uncertainties and plausible scenarios tell you. We have two questions up here, so we'll go to this gentleman and then. Steve, when you look at the future <clears throat> and you say that the amount of money that is going to take for, to deal with climate change, I say to you, what about the parts of the globe that will become uninhabitable as the temperature rises and what happens to those people? They become transients. They go to other countries. And what happens, we've seen already how displacing having a huge amount of immigrants to any country. Uh, it is my belief from a political standpoint that what we're going to see as those places become uninhabitable, that the amount of political disruption is going to mimic, is going to absolutely yep. take care of all of these things out of proportion. So, so I would question whether those regions will really become uninhabitable. Uh, first of all, as we know from basic science, there's more warming at the poles than the equator, and a lot of the regions you're talking about are in the equatorial band. The second is when you look at the professional modelers talk about their models, and Chris, you know Tim Palmer, I expect, quite well. Chris has said publicly and privately that you, the, at the regional level, the models are essentially worthless. We cannot tell at a regional level whether there's going to be more rain or less rain. And you can see that directly in the IPCC okay. AR system. Tim, Tim said that, not Chris. Uh, uh, yes, right, Tim. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, yeah. yeah, of course. But, you know, Tim is a serious guy. He's the father of ensembles, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Chris, do you have a comment to that? It, I, it's a really good question, and one of the things where we don't have good estimates is the, 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 the risk of, of loss of cohesive governance strategies and, and the current patterns that 
in, in much of the world, especially where the rainfall is consistently projected to decrease, uh, the Mediterranean, North Africa, parts of South Asia, really are unlikely to be able to sustain agriculture at anything like we've seen in the past. And what does happen to all those people and what does happen to the, to the strengths of the institutions and the governance that would be required in order to negotiate any future agreements? Uh, we need to have a, a world with, with viable governance in order to continue to make progress towards solutions. We, if you want to speak, let's get a microphone to you very briefly, uh, but then let's move on to the next question. What I see coming, and I'm not seeing all of Africa is going to go away. I'm only seeing that we're going to see more and more immigration, forced immigration, and that it's going to be so politically destructive that we're just going to see war after war after war. So let's be clear, perhaps, that the current immigration, a concern in this country uh, from the southern border, and the immigration out of Ukraine and the immigration from the Middle East is not climate driven. You ask those people what is the issue, it's their livelihoods, their safety, uh, and so on. If they had better institutions, we would not see that immigration, independent of what the climate's doing. Would like to go to, but as a reminder, um, these folks will be available after for further conversations. Uh, Julio Friedman, who some of you may know, I had a, a conversation with him a couple of days ago to set the stage for this whole conference on climate, so would love to hear from Julio. Sure, so Julio Friedman, Carbon Direct, and friends of all three people on stage. Um, <laughs> uh, I have about 90 comments and about 30 questions. I'm gonna condense it to one question in just a second, but with respect to the comment that was just made, Andrew actually has a perspective that's worth hearing, so briefly. Uh, thanks, Julio. I think it's a really good comment about uh, migration. But migration is not going to be because of climate. It's going to be because there is a lack of investment in these communities. The only way you build resilient communities is to invest in them becoming prosperous. It's the only way. If they're prosperous, they'll stay at home. If they're not, I can tell you the Mediterranean is not a deep enough no wide enough moat to keep people from the Sahel into Europe. So uh, it, as a follow on to those two, the one question I will ask, uh, GDP is a fine metric, but it is not a comprehensive metric. It doesn't represent the richness and the complexity that we are dealing with, the nonlinearity in the world, questions around biodiversity and ecosystem services and a whole set of other things. I would ask you, what other metrics do you think are important as we think about energy transition, climate risk, what else besides GDP should we be measuring and how should we be thinking about it to advise decision makers? It, well, it's, go ahead, all right. Look, um, money isn't everything, but to have more money is better than not having more money, okay? And when you look at the GDP energy story, there are six and a half billion people who use so little energy that it's gonna take so much to get them up to reasonable standards, independent of anything else. And so I would say that's where the issue is. If you ask those folks, and again, Andrew is maybe unfortunately the sole representative of uh, that, that says something already, right? Um, that's the overwhelming priority, is to get the energy so you can have the well-being and the GDP and so on. The rest of us, it's almost irrelevant. Let me just say that uh, I agree that there are many things that are not covered under GDP, and we, we should be thinking about, well, in the, in the IPCC formulation, they say unique and threatened systems, things like endangered species or heritage sites, things that are culturally important, uh, risks of extremes, distributional effects, how the poor are impacted relative to the wealthy, and I think those are... Um, probably the most consequential. And in the IPCC framework, the fifth is, is large scale tipping points, you know, commitment to many meters of sea level rise or um, a commitment to a major loss of biological diversity. One of the things that I think has been incredibly helpful about this discussion is that it's been framed around not the global average aggregate GDP, but the GDP of of people in vulnerable regions around the world and how investments in the energy transition can improve their future prospects.
In our final moments together, I want to do what I call a concluding lightning round. And since we just have a, a couple of moments left, I would politely ask both experts to um, keep your answers to one word or two, Max. <laughs> I know that's hard. You're both scientists, uh, used to using a lot more words, but uh, appreciate your compliance. Uh, this is a word association game. So what's the, what's the first word that pops into your mind when I say fusion? Long term. Uh, long term. You can't choose the same one. You have to choose. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's coming. <laughs> Slowly. Uh, <laughs> carbon tax. Um, useful, but unlikely. Boy, yeah. <laughs> hey, I bet you thought I didn't agree with Steve on anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it would be wonderful. I don't see the politics. China. China wants to be a leader in this space. Um, increasing use of coal and gas to satisfy growing energy. Sorry, too many words. Uh. Close enough. And uh, our final one, technological innovation. It's the US opportunity, the golden opportunity. Absolutely essential. Well, it is nice that we ended on some agreement. Uh, I want to thank the panelists for this lively conversation okay. and the audience. Mm -hmm.